So I thought this would be a really nice way for us to be able to kind of intimately kind of get to know a bit more about your experiences. Um, I guess everything from, from the beginning to where you are now. Um, and I thought what, what would be quite nice would be just to speak about now the Venice Biennale. Mm -hmm. um, have you found that, at, you know, how has that felt going into such a um, prestigious, has it felt like that for you? It did, absolutely. Um, because typically, uh, this is like for the architecture biennale. And so usually they will have other architects come into the space, um, and they, you know, make work or just transform the space to their liking. Um, <clears throat> but this year they decided to have one architect to oversee the entire space and they invite uh, at least I think five artists mm. to come in and make work. So it was very sculptural instead of um, architectural. Mm. And um, so that process has been really um, different, uh, quite unique um, because we're responding to their uh, theme, which is dancing before the moon. I think that's what it's called. And yes, yes. it's called that. <laughs> Thank God, because <laughs> I can't remember. Um, but like, it's, it's, it's really that. And so every space is, represents a phase of the moon, mm. um, the moon phases. And so, you know, everyone is doing something, you know, different and what is quite unique about that space is, is how everyone else interpreted it so, you know, differently. And, you know, and when we think about showing in that space, we think of large sculptures, large vessels, large, mm -hmm. everything is big. And I wanted to counter that with something small. So like the vessels are quite much smaller than what I'm usually, uh, you know, than I usually make. And so instead of having like feeling the space, um, I want it to be more of like maybe eight vessels, but allow the, the people to visually get a break, you know, cause everything is big. You're, you're, mm. you're looking up all the time mm. because it takes so much of the space. Um, but it's like a, the final, I'm the final phase of the moon. So like everyone, gets a break of like a breath um so it's like a place of meditation yeah. and um and that work is called a healing is coming which reference um kind of my you know family <coughs> religious practices so on my mother's side uh they did practice hoodoo and voodoo which is like um originally from from the West Africa Vudan which is like you know it's it's you're very connected to nature and things like that and uh, so you know when you think about like the the events of slavery they kind of they hit that they hit that to protect it they did you know went on and um, converted to like a uh, Christianity, Catholicism. Um, but that was, you know, more of a, you know, to protect themselves, to go along with what society that was kind of being built at that time. And, um, and but what they did secretly practice was voodoo and hoodoo, which is a way of them to kind of like um, overcome the consistent trauma that they're experiencing. And so like, you know, I think mainstream wise, we associate voodoo with, uh, to Haitian um, culture, which is, you know, which is very important, but it's also, it already existed in the States in Louisiana and Mississippi and all those Southern States. And it's just, um, they, you know, over time become more, I guess, outward, more accepting of, of this is what we do to protect ourselves, to um, get guidance, to, you know, to really connect with um, their own history that they lost, 
um, with every generation that's come, but it's not as necessarily as um, as devious as it's portrayed. You know, you think of like voodoo dolls and things like that, but it's, it's so much more than that. And just any religion, um, you have good practitioners and bad practitioners. It's just whatever you decide to do with that is quite, yeah, it's quite neutral. It's quite free flowing that way. I think it's really interesting that you work with ceramics where it kind of occupies this I don't know, this middle space of useful object and beautiful object and the idea of like the fun like the functioning body, I suppose. And mm. um I just I wondered how how you came to that medium as well. I know you work with a wide variety of mediums, um, but ceramics in particular um drew my attention. Um and so how you came to incorporate that into your practice. Um, uh, ceramics always have been part of, you know, because I studied ceramics a long time ago. I think about 13 years ago. Um, and so the, the craft um, principles, and, you know, with foundation, it's quite ingrained um, in, into when I think about things. And so I turned that into like a more of a theory my my ceramics um practice became a theory and so that means it's more flexible i can apply it to anything um any medium that i i chose i choose to go into and so like um because ceramics is it, it's 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 more than just a utilitarian um thing nowadays I think it's it's also it's historically have been a means to carry whether it's like sound in cathedrals like in those really tall concrete walls there is a massive if not multiple massive um, ceramic vessels to carry that sound mm -hmm. because concrete absorbs and doesn't you know reverberate um, or even if you think about like in Greek theater, uh, those like um, the just like the um, the paintings, the scraffito, the scratch mm -hmm. scratching through, that is actual um, recordings of live performances that they have. So I I love the idea of the vessel representing of what happened in the in the in, you know in in like live real life real time happening which is which is quite beautiful and so it's like building necessary like building a culture around vessels um a culture around utilitarian wear um because it means to connect with people and so that is what ceramics have been for me. It's, it's about connecting with people and it's about the people that I encounter and whether it's like in you know real life or just in fantasy, uh, but it always represent a moment. Right, yeah. yeah. I guess like the impressions of the body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, is it, so you'd say as much as the final product, like the process of actually creating a ceramic object yes. is vital to the... Yes, okay. yeah. Mm. And the the marks that you, the mark making that occurs on the vessels, mm -hmm. do, how does that compare to if you're working on a flat surface in a traditional? I don't know. Mm. If it's you know traditional painting. I don't know if you want to kind of yeah go that way. You know these kind of records of mark. How does it? I don't know. How does it relate to that, or does it? Oh uh, no, it does. It does. Um, it sometimes. Uh, it starts in a 2D painting mm. at mm. first, um, but I don't necessarily get so um, fixed on what it looks like in a 2D, you know, two-dimensional format because the idea of a sculpture, a three-dimensional sculpture, is for the person to be able to look around it. If it's just sitting there um, and only one side is painted, then the presentation of it will have to be catered to that, how it's painted. And so um, one thing that I, I use 
in the process of making the image uh, is jazz. I listen to a lot of jazz, a lot of a lot of jazz. He can definitely yes. attest to that. <laughs> a lot <Jazz>. of jazz. <laughs> and so whatever is coming out of that moment, mm. that is just kind of kind of that. Um, so it, sometimes it is a playlist. Sometimes it is a, a you know a specific song. Um, but all in all, it is just a, a representation of that moment. And it's the same thing with the throwing process. Uh, there is music playing while I'm making, and you know, and it's kind of like a, a dance in a way. So like when you when you think about painting on surfaces, on three-dimensional surface, any surface for that matter, you want to think about, you know, instead of like, oh, I'm painting on a, it's, it's all a plane. Mm. How it's being lit, how it's being interact. Um, you want to think about those things, but also, um, you know, like instead of, having just a vessel and then you just slapping an image on there. You got to think about the entire thing, the curves and how it's uh, being perceived. And um, yeah, so it's not necessarily like we, we think about, we just think of like a pattern that goes around, um, which is, you know, just as good, but um, you kind of want to invite the, the person who, who encountered these works uh, to, to be intrigued and to look, you know, around because there's multiple layers that is painted on top of each other instead of just one, mm -hmm. one flat um, uh, color or uh, image. Yeah. If it sounds like jazz music is quite integral to the kind of processes of making your work, and mm -hmm. I was wondering, I, and just the way you described it as dance, I feel like music and dance they're really like joyful expressions and. Do you kind of distinguish your work and your like leisure in a way? I don't know because I associate mm -hmm. that with mm -hmm. a kind of leisure, and mm -hmm. I wondered if you also carry that through in just your spare time, or maybe you don't have a distinction. Like maybe it's not so clear between work and leisure. Yeah, between the work and leisure. Like, you know, I it used to be separate. Like, it used really? to be separate. <laughs> Did you listen to different things. Yeah, like? it used to be separate, but it's like all together because yeah. it's you know because I noticed that it start feeding into one another. Yeah. And I was just like, no, it needs to be, it needs to be different things. I don't, I don't like that. But, you know, at some point I just let it happen. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Did you mind talking of, um, of jazz and also the interconnectedness of the different media that you've worked with? You've also composed, haven't you? You've also composed music. You've had yeah. musicians come and play in response to your could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I use graphic notation for my um, for my compositioning, um, and so I studied a lot of scores um, that is like like seventeenth century and things like that, and a lot of Gregorian um, music. Um, so it's it's a lot of just um, pattern, color, uh, thickness of line, and and give that um, like a like a symbolism to the musicians, and to talk to them and you know describe what that would sound like and things like that, um, and I, you know, sometimes if not most of the time for now, like I've been working with a lot of classical musicians so they are like trained to see things a certain way and what graphic notation does and you know whomever uses it is to kind of break that down so they're just like I know I need I need structure I was like no it's structured you just gotta <laughs> you just gotta accept it <laughs> <laughs> you just got to be okay with, you know, it's about opening them up um, and really feel what they are playing. So it can be as technical as you want it to be, but I want it to be, you know, technical, but it's like more emotional, which is um, 
very much representation of the American South, which is where I'm from. So like a lot of, you know, even when they're taught classical music, we're taught to feel it first rather than, you know, than just, you know, like, yeah, notation, that's cool, but that is not a primary concern. It's a secondary concern. And what, you know, and I've spoke with um, uh, like maybe a couple of uh, professors here that is into, that, that teaches theory and they say the same thing, you know, notation is secondary. Is the music is primary, the notation is secondary. So it's all about how you communicate and learn how to communicate um, to the musicians. Um, because if you have a classical musician and a jazz musician and you have the jazz score, they play in the right things, but it sounds completely different because they're trained to listen and see and perceive things differently. So what I typically do, which is very uncomfortable for them, is to break that down. And how I do that, um, how they express themselves, how they talk, is how they play. And so it's about deconstructing that communication for them to like kind of get away from that because as soon as they rely on their on their training, it becomes disconnected. So if you practice anything, if you do anything long enough, it's it's just by nature. So you're not you don't have to really think about it. You don't have to really feel, you know, but it's about to it's about breaking that down so they have to find their own way around the music and while listening to one another as they play. So you're trying to break down their habits? Their habits, habits. absolutely. Absolutely. Because yeah. it happens a lot as well in, in art making as well. Sometimes mm -hmm. you realise you pick up habits and things. Oh, yeah. Is that, do you think, where you kind of... Was it, in, was it intuitive for you to try and get them to do that? Like, where did that come from for yourself to kind of see that? Because it seems like... Well, I mean, like, I think it's just a, a musical culture. Yeah. You know, we in the American South, um, yeah. it is very natural. We use music a lot. Most of them, um, I don't want to say most of them, but a lot of them, um, whether they are... Uh, learn how to read music like a traditional score um, but when you go around especially like New Orleans if you go around there most of them are more technical players than academic players it's all about how they feel it's you learning the instrument the instrument can do far more than what is written you know to play so you want to break that into kind of get them to expand their own mind. So it's not necessarily breaking their habits, it's just to expand more than what they think um, their instrument can actually play. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, do, do say yeah. Uh... Can I ask you about um, your modes of firing and whether that process kind of comes first for you or whether you're thinking more about what you'd like the surface to look like and then you're picking your firing style in response to that? Um, well, the way I make um, my work, I can get the same results in any firing. It is just about understanding the kiln, because every kiln has its own behavior. Some fire is like, you know, hotter than others. Uh, some of them have like different type of heat movement within the space that does change the surface just it does change the the way the the vessel sits so it's all about understanding the behavior of the kiln um so i don't necessarily think about um what kind of kiln i'm using only if i'm using oxides because it is toxic <laughs> um and you know and if you use an oxides you cannot use that in the kiln that's inside a space you know a shared space um, because some of them have like a, their chemical reactions are quite um, potent. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like the, the, the vessels, you know, all depends if I wanted to 
um, you know, like an electric kiln and a wood kiln, an anagama kiln is, is completely different. So it's, it's quite naked to the elements. So you don't necessarily need a glaze to come on, to go on top because the wood ash is the glaze. Um, so that I think it will be more about positioning. So, but in most kilns that I use, uh, it, it doesn't really matter. I think it's just like, okay, so like at one point I, would, I double major as a, um, like an organic chemi chemistry. Um, and so we learned about the basics of what oxides do, the chemical reactions and things like that. So intuitively I know, but I think over time, um, for more people, most people, it's like uh, you just trial and error. That's all that really is, is trial and error um, to get it exactly. But because I am using other people's kilns and I have I have to rely on a technician <laughs> to see if they um, on on their way of firing, because um, there's a great amount of technicians that fire the way they fire their work. And there, that is a complete difference. Um, and so I formulated the surface and the way I, I paint the vessels and glaze the vessels, no matter who is firing it, it will still come out the same. So, yeah. I, I was just going to ask, having, having seen you work as well, I was struck by um, the kind of the way that you just do not seem to kind of compromise mm -hmm. creatively, you know, and it, it was an incredible thing to see, an incredible kind of energy. I was wondering whether you, do you acknowledge that? Do you feel that you are doing that? Or, and if so, you know, how, how do you maintain that? Because I feel like people are often, you know, push to compromise with various things. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you're doing that? Oh yeah, it's, uh, I'm actively not compromising. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not, um, because that is definitely a hard habit to break once you start compromising. Mm. Um, I think it's because it's so uh, connected to my point of view and how I move throughout life mm. that it's like you're, you're telling your own story in, in a sense, how you see things, your perspective, and everyone's perspective is very unique to one another. Um, so it is really important for me to be able to um, keep that, you know, quite sacred because it's very important. Because um, as soon as I start compromising, the quality of my work would change drastically. Mm. And, um, and no matter, because, you know, you know, when you're starting out, you don't really want to ruffle any feathers, feathers, but it's like, it's not, not compromising, it's not necessarily a means to be, you know, to cause conflict of, of any kind, but it's just to, like, it's, it's about the integrity of your work and integrity of your practice. Um, because, you know, when you start going into galleries, you're working with curators and things like that, and, you know, only compromise that is allowed is what can we do in the space? But like the work itself, no, I don't, I don't compromise that. Yes. Hey, just to pick up on that a little bit, um, that, comfort, not, that encounter between your work and its exhibiting environment, mm -hmm. what's been the most rewarding or successful in terms of your experience of making a show where it's really worked and really felt like it represented what you were aiming at in the actual practice? Yeah, man, let me tell you. So like for the Art Now presentation that I did, uh, there was like a group, <laughs> whole group of curators and like uh, people that are just like there to move things around. What was so great is that having the curator meet the artist where they are. That is so important instead of just like, I'm trying to do my job. No, I get it. <laughs> we'll get there, I promise you. But, um, you know, we had the music playing that I, that I did and we sat around, we walked around because it was like a circular plan type of plinth. And 
and we move things around. So it was like a choreograph, a chore choreography for the for the vessels. And that was really nice because everybody was like so in tune with one another, moving things. And I'm like, yeah, that was, a, yeah, I was tripping when I put it over there, but this is much better. Um, so it is it's about definitely trust. If you have a lot of trust um, from an artist perspective and the curators, then, you know, there's a much opened we're more inclined to be more open to whatever ideas that, that are there, but it is so important for you to meet the artists where they are um, because we're coming from a place where you're trying to change my work, but it's really just a presentation and you wanted to, you know, your both of your goals is to get it um, presented in its best, in the most and best capacity. So it's it's just kind of like, calming that anxiety down and that was the best experience that I have I, I have I have had you know so far this is one of, of um, several talks in a series to mark Black History Month here mm. and I just wanted to bring that element in and ask you um, having grown up in in the south of the US mm. and then coming here and studying and uh, working in Europe um, how has your experience been uh, in that regard how are the cultures different and uh, what do you feel, what are some of the key things that really need to change um, in, in moving forward progressively? Um, well, in the American South, we all are quite <laughs> socially, um, I guess marketed as very, very, very uh, racist. <laughs> so like we're, the racism there is quite um, in your face. They're more physical than intellectual, here is more intellectual than physical. So, um, and from a person myself coming from that space, I'm used to like being, you know, when we fight historically, fight is a physical fight. And sometimes it's a, you know, with intelligence. Um, but when we think of intelligence, we think it's passive in the States. And over here, intelligence is actually quite active, um, which is quite more insidious, more corrosive. Like it kind of breaks um, a person down from the inside out instead of from the outside in. So the, the, I think those different structures are quite different. Something that you can see, you know, um, but for over here, it's something you can feel, but you can't quite pinpoint where it's coming from. And so like expression, that's why expression is so important. Um, everyone in the South is quite loud. I am very loud, <laughs> contrary to what I am doing over here, but I'm quite loud and boisterous. And so bringing that type of energy here can come off as very aggressive and you know and there is there is an ongoing stereotype especially for for black people and I'm not talking about like black black British people because they carry themselves differently as well but like American black people we are very straightforward and <coughs> this is not this is not right so um, you know so there's that different approach and and feeling of not being heard that is a that is definitely that connection from both places but there is something about keeping reserving your humanity and empathy you know and it's it's it has nothing it's not about how you know really how another person believes or whether what they believe you you should do and who you should be and what you should be um it's about you know doing what you can for everyone to have the capacity to maintain their humanity because as soon as you lose that humanity and it is it is very possible to lose that your humanity along with your empathy and that's where you have a lot of issues. Um, so within my work, I talk about the people that are, 
you know, from neighborhoods that I lived in that are like uh, socially portrayed in media as something like, oh, this just violence, you know, lack of, um, like, not even, not even saying lack of integrity, integrity, but it's like lack of, of, um, like social norms, social, um, you know, communication and things like that and togetherness. No, everyone has that in their own way, but it's just that when you're not seen as, you know, as, as, as human as the next person, then that becomes problematic, you know? And so you, you know, the people that are receiving that, we're spending most of our time trying to correct that than to actually, um, uh, kind of enhance our own life, moving on with our life, just like anybody else. When you talk about, uh, you know, systemic racism and things like that is to keep you in the loop of this is not right. You're not hearing me. Now you haven't grown as a person. You haven't moved on. You're fighting against a thing that doesn't really exist or shouldn't even exist. But, you know, you want to occupy this space. You want to be here with everybody else. And yes, you know, you know, you want to go, you could go off and do things on your own, like um, entrepreneurship, but not everybody has that capacity to do that. So for some people, they enjoy working with people. They enjoy working with communities, but it's so hard to do that if you're constantly met with um, someone else's prejudice, which is called biases, um, and you making that person responsible for for whatever biases that you have. So it's more of a psychological torture, if you know, in my opinion. So you're like responsible for making them feel better, making um, people's, um, you know, things. And, and I think we all tend to do things and, you know, make decisions that, uh, that feeds into the story that we tell ourselves. So, um, if we feel like a certain person or a certain group is dangerous, so you don't even realize you make a decision that feeds into that to make them react to that. So that's a very psychological way of, you know, approaching it. And, you know, and so people who are margin, marginalized in that way, we become psychologists without a degree. We have to move and, and say things in a way because it's not about what you say in a moment. It's about how they remember it. And because words get lost Sometimes actions get lost if it's not too traumatic, but all in all, they will remember how you made them feel. And that is what they're, you know, what kind of goes into that. If it's met for so many times, quite too often, then, you know, instead of being heard um, about, you know, what their difficulties are, because you know, my issue is the action that you took, not you as a person, because I don't know you. So you have to really think about, okay, there's this issue that I may or may not create it. In, in most cases you have, you know, so like, how can we address that? You know, and definitely the first step is accountability. Like, yeah, I did that because in earlier stages, you know, people that are not being heard, we're not asking for you to lose your job. We're not asking you to give up anything. And maybe that is a fear for someone who is, you know, using these systems to their advantage. It's not a personal attack. We just want to be able to move freely, as freely as everybody else. So um, it is about accountability. You know, in most cases, you're not going to lose anything because we acknowledge it, there's always a pattern of this being acknowledged by, you know, whether it's a group of people or different people that comes in and out, that note has always been noted. It's just whether you want to, you know, put, shed light onto it, you know, and, and you think about like academic institutions, 
her goal is to not only um, have a really good experience, but always to come out better than you come in. But if you experience that in an academic space, you leave much worse than you came in. And so you are carrying that. And, and the understand is that when you carry that, when you carry that, you encounter more people and that spreads, that spreads. So, you know, it's not just you go, you study, it's done, it's all forgotten. No, you carry it with you. Every experience, whether it's just where there's race or it's, um, you know, gender, it's a sexual orientation, it's just beliefs, you know, and it's accountability. And if you don't want to change, then say that, then put someone else in place that can actually do that work and you can move somewhere else but it's still going to cause damage somewhere else. So it's about having that openness to be accountable, um, to understand that this did cause some, you know, serious damage to someone's um, psyche because they have to carry that with them. They have to go through therapy and all of that things to heal um, from that experience so they don't pass that on to someone else. Um, and, you know, and it's important to know when you think about like and you think of in psychology that you have the drama triangle, you have the persecutor, you have the perpetrator and you have the victim. And that is like, you know, when you don't have accountability, that victim can sometimes turn into a, um, a perpetrator, you know, act on, you know, act out and someone else gets the brunt of that. And that carries on. Nothing gets solved and things like that. And that is just more on a personal level than a Y systemic level. Um, but within my work, when I when I make and talk about the people that really has impacted my life, um, I do get questions, you know, um, and a lot, and some of those questions are quite prejudice and from their understanding or lack of understanding of, of, of not just different culture, just like um, being open to hear something different than what they're told, essentially. And so within that, I am usually met with misgendering, you know, I'm always called a he, you know, and things like that. And in writing or I'm reduced to how my body looks. Cause you know, quite, quite often I've been referred to as woman missing limbs and things like that. And people think it's, um, and I, and I'm, I'm going to assume that it is a way of like, look, she's doing it like an inspiration thing. It's not inspirational. It's actually quite offensive. Don't do that. You know? Um, and even within relation to other, you know, a group of um, female, black female artists um, that I've been a part of. And, you know, everyone else has talked about in very such high regard. But when it came up to me, it was like, you know, woman born without any legs and things like that. And it doesn't go any further, you know. So it is um definitely an intellectual um, racism thing, a discrimination in a way that you're presented not as engaged as you are, um, you know, and the questions are like, even within that, you know, in that interview, it was more about, so like, how do you apply, you know, woman, you know, you know, being a woman to your work. And I was like, well, I am a woman. It's not a, it's not a thing that you can take off. Um, it is, you know, whatever I make, that is womanhood, you know, it's not something that can be applied. It's something that you kind of are, you know, whatever I decide to make, it's going to be a representation of that, you know? And so, and that was like kind of a, not a pushback, but it's just to say, yeah, that question was not good. Um, 
<laughs> you should totally change that entirely. So if it's not discrimination, prejudice against people with disabilities, physical disabilities, um, it's discrimination because I'm, I'm a woman or, you know, being black, being from a different social class, I'm from a like working class, lower class. Um, and so like monetary things means different to so many people. And so like, I don't necessarily focus on the money. I mean, of course you want to take care of yourself, but that's not, you know, you know, if I, if that was the case, my work would look completely different. It would be definitely, you know, bubblegum pop type work that is just can be disposable at any time. Um, but it's something that's quite meaningful because, you know, it's just like connecting with people. But also with, with that being said, I challenge my own views because um, I haven't, you know, encountered as many people as I did here versus in the States, um, especially in the American South, um, due to lack of access. And that's another thing, it's the lack of access. And so how I would see certain people, you know, it is quite negative. And so you meet, you know, you, you know, you see that everyone is individually making their own decisions about how they want to interact with people, you know, how they want to move within life. And so um, just to understand it's not a like a group thing. It's definitely an individual thing. And so instead of trying to make everyone else into like this, um, you know, it's probably a trauma response, but it's like um, as something that is just negative and bad and assuming the worst um, you know, for me, it's about, you know, kind of being open, start off with that. And then, and then, and then I, then I make a decision, but, um, yeah. So it's, it's wanting other people to change how they see things, but also challenging myself on how I see things, which sometimes it is wrong. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.